Hello, uh, my name is Kuo Ming Rao. I'm the Artistic Director of the 31st Singapore International Film Festival. Welcome to the QMA with Sue Williams, the director of Denise Ho Becoming the Zone. The film was screened as part of this year's Moonlight Cinema. Hello, Sue. Many thanks for joining us from New York. It's quite early there. Yeah, well, many thanks for inviting me. I'm really so pleased the film could be seen in Singapore and just really happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. I first want to start, uh, Sue, I know that um, previously you have made documentaries on well-known public figures, uh, for example, Eleanor uh, Roosevelt and Mary Pickford, for example. However, from what I understand, uh, you didn't know anything about Denise Ho when you first uh, introduced to her. And it was a time when Denise Ho was having a difficult time in her career. So can you share with us, and this is also the question some of the audience ask, can you share us, with us um, how did you first introduce to her and what was the circumstance? Sure. Um, yeah, obviously I knew a lot about Eleanor Roosevelt and Mary Pickford <laughs> before I started um, working on a film about them. Um, I'd never heard of Denise. I didn't really know, I didn't know much about Canto Pop. I knew a little. You know, I've worked in China for many, many years and um, I spent a lot of time in Hong Kong and um, a mutual friend introduced us in the summer of 2017. And um, honestly, when I first met Denise, um, you know, I was told she was this like big pop star in Hong Kong and Asia. And uh, I would never have guessed she's, she's very quiet, kind of quiet, a little bit shy actually, very down to earth. And I had a really hard time imagining her as you know, a glamorous star singing to stadiums. So, um, but we had a nice conversation and agreed to talk more. And she sent me a bunch of her CDs and DVDs. And um, this was in the summer of 2017. And she had gave a concert in London, England, um, in November that year. And I flew over to watch the concert. And that's when I saw the minute she gets on stage, it's like something happens and she becomes this star and she commands the audience and she loves being on stage. And so, and that's when I thought, yeah, I've, I've got to make a film about her. Um, so I went uh, and spent a week with her in Hong Kong, just kind of getting to know her and seeing what her life was like and understanding uh, the issues of being an artist in Hong Kong, especially when you're having a difficult time with China and, um, and then we started, we filmed all through 2018 and the first part of 2019. And then kind of everything changed in the summer of 2019. So in a sense, when you first approach her, you haven't really decided whether you are going to do a documentary on her and what angle you're going to choose or pick from her life. Well, I think, you know, after I spent time with her, um, there were a lot of aspects um, of her life that interested me. I was interested in her time in Canada and how those Western values, those democratic values that she grew up with in Montreal that she talks about, how they impacted her life and her way of being. Um, but I was also interested in her as an artist and as an artist, how do you have a career if China has blacklisted you? And that was, um, that was very interesting to me. And she was trying to, I think we think of herself, you know, the way she worked as an artist as well. And, and all those things were interesting to me. Okay. So in a sense, uh, I think you were at the time when she was trying to find her identity. We know that when documentary filmmaker uh, trying to document uh, uh, someone, it takes time for you, for the filmmaker to get to know this person. Uh, Denise, of course, she's not uh, unfamiliar with the camera, but do you feel it takes time to kind of, for her to open up to you? How do you feel that process as a documentarist? Sure. I mean, the first week that I spent with her, when we spent hours together every day, um, I didn't record any of it. Mostly we were just chatting. Um, she explained to me about her Buddhist faith and, for example, and none of that was recorded. Then I started um, doing some audio recordings towards the end. 
and um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but I didn't film her immediately. And, and I, we actually had a discussion. I said, you know, it's really strange. I've made films about other famous women, but they've always been dead. So, you know, they, they, um, it's kind of just been whatever I think. And I did, um, I did want her input, for example, on what music, what of her songs she thought I should include. Um, but she was very trusting. I mean, she never said, you have to talk about this or you can't talk about that or... Um, She's, I think she's a very open person, as you can, as people who follow her on social media, especially at that time, could see. Um, so she was very open. She watched a, a rough cut of the film and corrected some facts, um, but basically really gave me a lot of freedom um, in how to put the film together. Mm, okay. In fact, she had no editorial control. Um, she did not have, I had editorial control. Yeah, actually, that's one of the questions the audience want to ask uh, if if she put any ideas or was she had did she have any control over the content? So as you said, it's actually all your decision. Yeah, I mean, before she went on tour, she said, and you know, she went to many places, <laughs> mm. and we couldn't afford to film at all of them. So I asked her which she thought would be the best concerts and the ones that I should make sure. So she got, you know, she helped me in that sense. And she told me that Montreal, the concert in Montreal at the beginning of the film would be very emotional for her. And sort of going back to her, her roots, so to speak, or part of her roots. And it was, you know, as you saw in the film, she, she could barely sing the song Montreal. She got so emotional about it. Did you get to meet some of her friends from the Montreal period? Did you mm -hmm. interview? But you, you didn't include that part. How did you choose which part you decide to put in or, or not? Um, that's always, that's the hardest thing, isn't it? I mean, that's really the hardest thing. And we obviously we filmed uh, with a few people who in the end we didn't include in the film. But I should say it was, it was difficult. People in Hong Kong were very cautious about being interviewed for the film. Um, it was, it was a challenge and many of, as she says, many of her former colleagues and close friends have really put a distance between her and themselves. Um, so it was, it was difficult to get some interviews. The Canadian friends, um, I, they, they, they were lovely and they're super nice and they're, but they, they just didn't quite work as, as interviews at that point. Mm, okay. So uh, when do you uh, shoot her with her family? Because we see one part, she, you go to her family. How was her parents kind of uh, taking you uh, as a documentary? Is there anything her family want to share with you? Oh, they're lovely and they're really, really involved in her life and career. And, you know, they go to all of her concerts and they have enormous faith and trust in her. Um, no, they were just, they were very, they're sort of quite an open, sort of welcoming family, really. They, they were, um, I don't know, it was just like going to meet the parents of some friends, you know, they were just lovely. <laughs> um, I can't think of, you know, I wanted to know about the family, so I was asking a lot of questions and, and, um, I think generally people are pretty happy to talk about themselves and they were very open with me. So when you were with her, you sort of feel she's uh, sort of quite uh, quiet and you didn't feel she, in, in the beginning, you didn't feel like she's sort of like star, but when you see, when you saw her on stage, then you come across her, like she has that star power. So when you, when you edit the footage together, I suppose, how did you uh, choose to piece the film? What kind of logic you guide you to put the yeah. film together? A couple of things. I just want to go back to the point about her being a star. She actually, before a concert or when she's on tour, actually does kind of enter this other space. Like she stops being a producer. She stops being Chad. She really goes into the zone of performing and she doesn't want any distractions. And she, you know, she really focuses on what she's doing. So in that sense, she 
she becomes a star earlier than when she goes on stage, I guess maybe. But it's the magic of the moment when she hits the stage that is so strong. Um, I wanted the songs to help tell the story. Um, because, you know, I think an artist's work is always indicative of their life, is telling something about their life, even though it may not be explicitly so. So I did ask her for help on that, actually, which she thought, you know, would be the 15 songs that I should really think about putting using in the film. And so she gave me a list. Obviously, they didn't all make it. And then some... I, a couple that I added that weren't, but but it was a it was a really good guideline. She's got a big repertoire. She's made a lot of albums, so um, that was really helpful. And you know, as I said, I was just trying to use the songs to tell her personal story. And for me, the lyrics were incredibly important. That was another uh, really tricky part was the translation from Cantonese. When she introduced the song to you, were the lyrics already translated? Were you listened to it and then listened to her describing the film to you and you later get to know exactly what the lyric is about? I had, I had rough lyrics. Um, someone had done rough lyrics. But Cantonese is such a different language. I mean, just, I think, I don't speak it, but I think it's full of images and, and it's very poetic and, and very difficult to translate. So I knew roughly what the songs were about, but we worked a lot. I mean, I worked a lot, both with Denise, with one of her lyricists, with all sorts of translators and young canto pop fans here in New York who knew her songs and, and so on. Um, so that was actually a huge challenge. And it's one reason why, I don't know if you noticed, but we put the lyrics of the songs, we moved them around because I wanted the viewer's face, the viewer's eyes always to be on her face and not be going down to the bottom of the screen to read the lyrics. So the idea was if they're sort of on the same level basically as her face, which was, was a challenge to place them in and of itself. But that's how important I felt like we have to see her and we have to almost absorb the lyrics as she's singing for people who don't speak Cantonese. Were there any moment you feel like uh, you feel like oh it's a shame that I didn't have my camera with me I hope I could capture that moment is there any moment you share with her that you didn't manage to include in the documentary? Oh yeah well we followed her for a year so there were you know lots of things um, she did um, on occasions keep video diary record video diaries for us. And some of the footage that you see uh, in the protests in the film was actually shot by her or someone on her team. So they, they were super helpful in, because obviously I couldn't move to Hong Kong for a year um, and shoot nonstop for a year. So we worked out um, some things like her recording moments of particular importance. And they didn't all make it into the film, but it really helped me stay in touch and, and you know, keep up to date with how she was feeling about things. So it, that was really, that was really helpful. And of course you and Denise, uh, you are from United States and Denise, although she sort of have her teenage, uh, teenager years in Canada, but she's from Hong Kong. And then uh, she's also a different generation of pop star. But do you feel in her story, there's something mm -hmm. um, trans, cultural and then she can be someone that still resonates with people in different continent and different generation. I actually am also Canadian and spent similar years in Canada. So I think, you know, I, I sort of culturally, I understood that part of her very quite well. Um, I would say, I would never presume to say I, you know, understand Hong Kong culture like a Hong Kong person so that but I think there are commonalities that we all share you know it's we care about our families we care about our jobs we care about our children we care about our parents we we just really want to have somewhere nice to you know acceptable to live and food on our plates you know what we, we've got a lot of concerns just everyday things that we all share as human beings so I think 
um, when she talks about freedom and the right to express herself through her art or, or politically, those are things really that most people can understand. And, and I think, and obviously love, I mean, love is a big part of her, her songs and, um, we can all understand that, the, the desire to be loved, the desire to love. So I think we have enough that, um, that yeah, it is universal. We live in the specific, specificity of our, 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 of our country's contexts, but we all share the same, ultimately the same aspirations. Mm. We, have a, we have a question from the audience. The audience said, so uh, Denise, when she first started, she very uh, much uh, kind of look up for her mentor in a sense, uh, Anita Moy. And then Anita Moy's uh, style is very uh, performative, very kind of, uh, kind of uh, glam rocking away. But yeah. we can see because of her choice and because circumstance, Denise come from that to <laughs> a very kind of sort of stripped to basic part. Do you see her getting more to her authentic self or from your interaction with her, you feel she's kind of always the same person? There's nothing like she is different. How, how did you feel with your time with her? You know, I think imagine that you're like a 13 year old girl and the Madonna in your, in your world, you become her, you know, you dream, uh, you, 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 you know, you love her music, you love her style, you think she's fabulous. And then you happen to have, you get the opportunity to be mentored by her. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Um, and, and I think there definitely was a struggle for Denise to free herself from that legacy of being Anita's mentee uh, or disciple. It was a big struggle. And you, you can, but I think she is far more her authentic self now. Um, and then, but I also think it's a question of growing up. It's, it's losing those sort of adolescent dreams and fantasies of a world that you may perceive from a distance as being very glamorous and fabulous and actually getting into it and, and realizing the costs of celebrity and, and having the courage to have your own identity and, and to make that real to your audiences. Um, you know, I found it extraordinary that when she came out as lesbian, in her concerts before that, she's singing about love between two men, between Lewis and Lawrence, and the entire audience, like 60,000 people, 100,000 people are all singing along with her. They all know the lyrics, they know what the song is about, and I've never seen another singer sing so openly about gay love and be so embraced by an audience. And you know, she describes it as they're, they're sort of releasing their inner selves. And again, I think that's about dare, you know, having the courage to be who you know in your heart you are, but often are afraid to express it. Do you see in the future you may uh, pick up the camera and carry on telling Denise's story? Well, that's a tricky question, isn't it? <laughs> um, I, you know, the political situation in Hong Kong is incredibly, um, I'm, I'm not sure how frank I should be here, but it's very scary and it's very, um, it's a very, very difficult time in Hong Kong. And um, I'm not sure that I'll be allowed back in. And uh, I think we'll have to see. I mean, we stay in touch. Um, and um, we'll have to see. We'll have to see how things unfold. Okay. And how was the reception of the film in United States in North America? I think people have really liked it. Um, you know, we got great reviews. The New York Times picked it as a critic's pick of the week. And I think they saw a lot of what we've been talking about, this desire for expression, self-expression, and... And her courage, her really terrific, tremendous courage um, during the protests uh, really resonated here and, and made, you know, the reviewers really saw a commonality between some of what's been going on here in the U.S. and other countries around the world where there are, being, there are protests now. Um, 
so yeah, I think they saw the universality that you, you were asking me about earlier. Yeah, and I, I think our audience also uh, shared with us that um, some of them wrote in and say they find a very inspiring and then courageous documentary and they want to share this with you and then of course with um, Denise Ho. So um, thank you very much. It's very early in New York. Uh, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.